Hello, everybody. Hi, Miriam. Hi, Daisy Stomper. Hi, Seaborch. Half a pack of Oreos. Wow. Welcome, welcome. Get started in just a couple of minutes. Hope everyone is doing well. Hey, Caleb. <laughs> I also have the urge to say morning most of the time, but then I realize people are possibly watching this all over the world at different times, and so I just say hello most of the time. <laughs> Hello in stereo. Hey, Dimitri. Okay, let's get right to it. Um, welcome, everybody. Week five. Today, hey, Jarvis, we're going to uh, finish up talking about envelopes, envgen and env, and just kind of round that out. And then we're going to talk about multi-channel expansion, which is a feature we've been using a little bit already, but we're going to dive a little deeper. It's a, basically how Super Collider uh, deals with multi-channel signals on the server and syntactically. Okay, now uh, let's get back into envelopes. So um, let's make a sound function. Uh, let's see, we'll use, I'm gonna sort of copy, loosely copy one of the examples from the homework where I asked everyone to make a synth stab. Um, and we also sort of got into filters a little bit. Um, all right. All right, so here is, got to boot the server, don't we? So here's a, here's a sound function we're playing called x. x equals this function dot play. We got a sawtooth going through a low pass filter with a cutoff at 1000, scaling down the amplitude and using exclamation point two. <laughs> and just to show you how this filter works, we can lower the cutoff. Or raise it, and it's just kind of your base, basic uh, filtered sound. So uh, let's make an envelope. Right? We made an envelope in this homework for the amplitude as well as the cutoff frequency. And I'm gonna, I'm not gonna make mine too stabby. Uh, hi Nils, hey <laughs> AXG, hey Eric. Um, bat against a baseball. Interesting. Um, okay, so this this will make, will make go from zero to one to zero. This isn't going to be particularly stabby, but uh, we'll say go up one second and then three seconds on the way back down. Uh, just, uh, we'll just make this linear. I'm not really too picky today. And then we sort of got in the habit of saying done, action, two. Which uh, when this envelope reaches its end, it checks its done action, and if it's two, then it frees or destroys or removes or annihilates the synth algorithm that it is a part of. And so we're going to say sig equals sig times env. So simply just multiplying this envelope, which, um, by the way, I'm just going to plot it in line here just so we can see it. There it is. Basic sort of asymmetrical triangle. 
And this should sound, uh, you know, like fairly predictable. Let's bring our scope into view. It's always nice. I think we don't need that anymore. And also the node tree. And just to recap last week, when we have done action two, this white box, which represents the synthesis process, disappears from existence uh, when the envelope reaches its end. If we don't provide a done action, then the default is zero. It's going to sound exactly the same, but this process lives on and continues to output zeros uh, uh, basically forever and ever. <clears throat> so done action two is nice because it cleans up after us. And in this homework problem, I asked you to make a second envelope. Um, in fact, let's copy and paste this and change the numbers, save ourselves a little bit of time. So we are going to say we'll go from 15,000 down to 500 over four seconds with a kind of a slopier curve. So that one is going to look like this. So the minus four causes it to bend inward like this. It starts at 15,000 and over the course of four seconds drops to 500. So we have to remember to take this plot away. And we're going to plug that in for our cutoff frequency, which was a fixed 1,000. But now it's going to go from 15,000 to 500 over four seconds with this curve. So it'll sound like this. Let's make it even slopier. Okay. I want to explain why it's not exactly the greatest habit in the world to instinctively tag done action two on the end of every env. Um, now in this particular case, these envelopes have the same total duration. This one's got one segment that's four seconds long. This one's got two segments whose durations add up to four seconds. So in this case, having two done action twos is actually redundant. It's also completely harmless, but redundant nonetheless. So for example, if we take, uh, sorry, I should have command period. I never actually got rid of that old one. Um, if we, um, if both of these have done action two, no harm, no foul. Um, I'm not even sure which done action is the one freeing the synth. Uh, I, I have no idea. I assume it's the first one. Who knows? But if we take this away, it still works as we want it to. The synth disappears because there's at least one done action too. So when this envelope finishes, poof goes the synth. Uh, so let's bring back done action two here. And let's say uh, we are going to make our frequency envelope shorter. So it's going to go from 15,000 to 500 more quickly. It's going to go instead of Aha. So here's the rub. Here's what's happening here. We have two envelopes. They're independent. They're being used to control two different aspects of the synthesis. This one is shorter. It's only one second long, and it has done action two. So this envelope finishes first, the one called freak env, finishes first, and it says, oh, I'm done. I better check my done action. Oh, it's done action two. Bam, everybody out, and it disappears. And, and this one was not finished. In fact, it was sort of just getting started. It ramped up to its full amplitude, and it was just about to start its release, but then this one sort of called the game early on account of rain. Uh, so the, the takeaway here is as you write your synthesis algorithms, you want to be thinking which envelope or which finite process, if there is one, represents the true lifespan of the synth. Um, you know, in other words, which of these finite processes or which of these two envelopes is the one which when it's finished, the sound is truly over. And that would be this one. Uh, this one is not only longer, but it's being used to control the amplitude. And at the end, it's zero, which means 
the sound is all zeros and it's all silent and there's nothing left to do. So uh, it would be appropriate in this case to remove done action two from this envelope so that it goes from 15,000 to 500 after one second. It just sits at the end. It just sits at 500 and keeps cranking out 500s. This one is allowed to finish and it says, okay, now done action two. Away goes the sound. Um, you can similarly imagine uh, if uh, you know this. Uh, let's let's just see if we can do this. So if this this one is long and um, this one is short. So now this one's only 0.4 seconds. It has done action two, but this is a long frequency sweep over four seconds. So that sounds like this. Whole sound is uh, four seconds, amplitude goes up and down, and this barely has any time to get from point A to point B. It maybe gets down to 13 or 12,000 or something. And that's the end. So this, this configuration doesn't really make much sense either. Um, I mean, there's nothing really wrong with it, but it, it's you, the programmer, have made a confusing, uh, or me, the programmer, has made a confusing decision uh, you know, why, why bother making this envelope so long uh, if I'm not going to let it actually get to the end? So when you have multiple finite processes, envelopes or something similar, you want to make sure they're all harmonious and that the, the appropriate one takes the responsibility of done action two. So that's that. Um, I want to move on now from finite duration envelopes to indefinite length envelopes. So there's basically two kinds of envelopes, the kinds that when they start, they have a, a known fixed duration, uh, five seconds, 10 seconds, whatever. You know exactly when it's going to end based on the time it starts. And then there are indefinite length envelopes or sustaining envelopes, envelopes which begin and then uh, their actual lifespan is, the duration is unknown at the onset time. They're uh, completed or released or finished by some external process. It might be the user running some code, might be another unit generator, might be some other process, but we don't actually know um, sort of how long they, uh, uh, how long they're going to be when we start them. So I'm going to copy this and do a sort of modified version. We're going to forget about this uh, freak env. Uh, we'll come back to this env in just a second. Let's do a sign ask, just something sort of basic. We don't need that filter anymore. Okay, so we got a sine wave. We're scaling down the amplitude. And in this particular case, if we bring these back here, basic envelope. One second up, three seconds down, done action two. So this env.new is often used to create fixed duration envelopes. There's a few others. Um, that I like to use, there's env.perk, which gives you a percussive envelope where we expect uh, attack time, release time, basically. So we can say uh, 0 0.1 sec 0 0.2 seconds up, uh, 0.5 seconds down. We can give it an overall level and then a, a curve. I'm just gonna skip those and that gives us a... Of course, there's nothing stopping you from doing something like this and kind of reversing it. There's also env.triangle. We plot it just a basic isosceles triangle um, and it only expects um, a duration so and, and a level. So if it's one, it's going to be 0.5 seconds up, 0.5 seconds down. Hey, Luis. Right. Uh, so if you go to the env help file, you can scan through all of the uh, class methods, env new. Um, what else? Some basic ones. Uh, lin n is a pretty standard one. It's basically three linear uh, segments with an attack time, sustain time, release time. So that's going to look like this. Just basic trapezoid. These are all finite duration envelopes. So let's let's forget about finite duration for a second and let's do arguably the most common type of sustaining envelope, an ADSR envelope. And here we have an attack time a decay time, a sustain level, and a release time. So I'm just going to fill in the defaults here. And then let's go ahead and say done action two. And so let's just 
Let's just do this. Let's see how this goes. And there it goes. It's running. You heard the sort of initial spike uh, amplitude all the way up and then 0.3 seconds down where it hovers at 0.5 forever. And now the obvious question might be, okay, how do we finish it off? How do we do this one second release? And with the code as I've written it, it's not possible. Um, we need to do a little bit more. Specifically, we need a gate. If we look at uh, the arguments of envgen, here they are. So far, we've only been providing the envelope, which is an instance of env, and then skipping all the way to the end and providing a done action. But the second argument for envgen is a gate. And gate is the argument that determines whether to continue holding the envelope open or whether to begin the final stage of the envelope. Uh, right, so um, what we should do here is declare an argument. Because a gate is just like the frequency or the amplitude in the sense that it's a, it's a synthesis input that we want to be able to control. We want to be able to say, now change the frequency to this, now change the amplitude to this, now set the gate to this or that, and we'll initialize it at one. So we've got our ADSR envelope with a gate and a done action too. So now we can play this, and then while it's running, we can set the gate argument to zero in the exact same way that we've set frequency or amplitude in previous videos. And there we go. And because we have done action two, that process destroys itself at the end. Right? There it is. And one second after we set the gate to zero. So the way gate works is that um, uh, it basically serves as a, a trigger uh, or or a, a value when it undergoes a non-positive to positive transition that causes the envelope to start or restart. And as long as this value remains positive, the envelope will sustain. And when the gate undergoes a transition from a positive value to a non-positive value, for example, one back to zero, then um, uh, it, the, the it causes the the last segment of the envelope to play. Um, let's change this. Uh, let's, let's what are we going to do here? I'm gonna I'm gonna separate out the function itself. Um, we'll call this f, and then we're gonna say x equals f dot play, specifying uh, gate initially to be zero. Okay we've made that process and because gate is initially zero the envelope hasn't actually begun but we can now set it to be one and then set it to zero to finish it and done action two cleans it up so we can't say okay now start yourself again because done action two has destroyed that process so if you want to be able to re-trigger an envelope after it's completely finished, that's a good reason to provide done action zero or just ignore the done action altogether. So now, we open the gate, the envelope begins, zero fades it out, and we can re-trigger it as many times as we like. Right, we can hold it open, leave it open, Go have a cup of coffee and set the gate. And it'll just stay there because there's no done action two anymore. So we'd have to actually say x dot free to sort of wipe it off the table. So essentially when you have a sustaining envelope and you want to be able to turn it on and off, on and off, and kind of keep it alive and just kind of idle in the background, done action zero or no done action whatsoever. But if it, you're just going to imagine just a sort of a one shot where you open it up, let it play, and say, okay, now you're done, done action two will make it into a, a one time use only. So I want to keep, um, keep the idea of gate on the table and go back to a fixed duration envelope for a moment. So let's do env.perk. And we'll just do this. Right? So we have a percussive envelope. 
one cent a second up and half a second back down. There it is. And we will initialize. And it doesn't have a done action too. So initialize this synth here. Gate is initially zero, which means it doesn't play. We haven't yet begun, but we've instantiated the process. And then we can say x.set gate one. And that initializes the envelope, but this is not a sustaining envelope. It's just a, a, a one-shot fixed duration envelope. So it goes through its, its little shape and then that's it. And uh, if we run this again, you might expect it to work, but it doesn't. We have to actually manually set this to zero and then so we can, but this, I mean, this is pretty clunky. And the reason we have to do this is because uh, the gate argument will only start or restart if there is a non-positive to positive transition at the gate argument. And uh, if we set it to zero, okay, now setting it back to one constitutes a non-positive to positive transition. But if we do it again, it's already at one. So we're just, it, the value of gate is already hovering at one inside of this process here. It's one, 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 one. And so we're saying, set yourself to one. And it says, okay, I'm already at one, whatever. So it's not going to work. Um, so it is possible to re-trigger an envelope by manually setting the gate back to zero, setting it back to one. But here I'm going to show you a trick, which uh, I didn't learn for very many years of using SuperCollider until, until somebody showed it to me. Uh, and... There's a bit of language about this in the synthdef help file, and it's right here. Arguments that begin with T underscore uh, are specified as trigger controls. So trigger control arguments behave differently from normal arguments. Normal arguments just hold their value. You set it to a value and they stay at that value forever. Trigger control or trig control arguments if you set them to a non-zero value, they output that value for a very small amount of time, for just one control cycle, and then they snap back to zero by themselves automatically. And so we are going to do that. We're going to say t underscore gate and reflect that change here. So now we've got a function, and the only change is we have modified our argument so that it's a trig control type of argument. And so now uh, we'll initialize it with the gate at zero. Oops, I think I had a leftover process. Okay, so there it is. And so now we can say x.set t underscore gate. And the reason we can do this is because whenever we set t underscore gate to one, it goes to one for just a fraction of a second and then goes right back to zero. So it sort of does the um, does this uh, resetting process automatically. This is this is the primary purpose of these types of arguments. This is why they exist. It's to be able to trigger re-triggerable processes like envelopes without having to manually reset the gate to some non-positive value. So this is a little trick should definitely keep in mind. Uh, let's add. Uh, let's just copy this. I want to try to keep as much work as possible. Get that around. All right, so now uh, what we're going to do is add done action two. So now, oh, all right, I got to hit command period again here. All right, so we've got to, we just modified this process. So the envelope once again has done action two. We initialize the synth with a gate value initially at zero. And now we're going to, Trigger it. But we can't do it again. We triggered it one time and enough time passed, basically 0 0.01, 0 0.5, so a total of 51 centiseconds. Uh, and the envelope got to the end. We, we allowed the envelope to get all the way to the end and it said, done action two, I'm out of here. And it disappeared. So we there's no synth to re-trigger anymore. Now, if we made this like four seconds, then we might be able to catch it before it dies.
But if we wait too long, four seconds or more, then we have missed our window of opportunity. So all these examples are meant to illustrate basically the interplay of done action two versus done action zero and uh, whether the envelope is sustaining uh, or fixed duration and whether there is a gate or T underscore gate argument. Um, envelopes are really flexible and as a as a side effect, they, it, they've got a lot of features and uh, they take a little getting used to. But these are really important concepts to master early on because they allow you to have very precise control over the duration and lifespan of your synths and also being able to clean up after yourself and, and keep the uh, server, the, the, the node tree, nice and tidy. Okay, I want to move on to multi-channel expansion. There is a guide file called multi-channel expansion, which is worth taking a look at. Um, if I could summarize this in one sentence, it would be that the server interprets arrays of signals as multi-channel audio. And we've been doing this a little bit already by exclamation point two. When we say exclamation point two, it transforms that into an array of size two containing two copies of the thing that that was applied to. Okay, now let's, um, let's, let's just do a quick example here. Uh, we'll say var sig, sig equals lfsaw.ar, uh, sig equals lfsaw.ar, same thing we did earlier, just a um, sawtooth wave going through a filter. And if we just scale it and leave it there, this ugen, and all the eugens involved and all the processes involved, it's entirely monophonic, as we can see on the meters. And on the scope and in your ear, right? It is just one channel. And when we say sig equals sig exclam2, it takes that signal and it turns it into uh, something that basically looks like this. So this is an alternative to what we just did. Okay, now um, if we were to do, uh, makes it a little quieter, uh, exclam four, or eight, or 30. Yes, we are creating an, an array of size 30, a 30 channel signal, how exotic. Um, and when I say channels, I mean, you know, like the way you have quadraphonic sound or like a 5.1 home entertainment system with five, actually yeah, six channels of audio. You got your left, right, rear, left, rear, rear, right, center, and subwoofer. So it's actually, you know, six channels of audio. And here I'm doing 30. Casually. Um, where are they? Where, you know, we don't see them. We don't hear them. The sound doesn't sound any different. Um, so let me... Uh, modify this. So instead of doing the multi-channel expansion here, converting from mono to a, a size two array, uh, I'm going to do it here. So I'm providing an array for the frequency argument of LF saw. It should sound a little bit different if I make this a more substantial change. You can hear what's happening here. Multi-channel expansion is taking place, and we're getting uh, 80 hertz in the left, 90 hertz in the right. We can see the difference. We can hear the difference. So if I do something like this. I'm adding all of these. This should be a five-channel signal with five, um, five different frequencies. And we don't hear it. Uh, so I'm going to do... Uh, first of all, I... I we're, I'm going to do something that will allow us to see these signals, but we still won't hear them. Uh, S.options.num output bus channels is a way of configuring the Super Collider audio server to say, I would like this many channels of audio output, stuff that goes to hardware, to my interface, to my mixer, to my speakers, etc. And in order for these changes to take effect, we have to reboot the server. S.reboot. Okay, so we're back online, 
and uh, we're going to say um, s dot meter. And there we go. We got our local host levels, and it should look a little bit different. So now we actually have eight output channels, All right? So let's um, let's run this. Now it should sound the same, but you can see that we do in fact have five signals on channels zero, one, two, three, and four. Uh, it's just that there's there's no way to um, I mean, maybe there, there are very exotic ways to stream multi-channel audio across the internet, but I'm just using my built-in sound card. I've got headphones. You've all got headphones out there. So we can only, as a collectively, we can only accommodate two channels. So where do the rest of these go? Well, they just go into the nether, basically. They just, they silently play themselves into the abyss and nobody is there to hear them. Um, uh, so let's, let's do, um, I'm just trying to tweak the synthesis a little bit here. Uh, what you have to keep in mind is that, uh, well, no, let's take a step back for a second. <clears throat> so we have this example. I want to walk through the way multi-channel expansion behaves and how it propagates through, uh, a, a UGen function. As it says here in the guide file, multi-channel expansion will propagate through the expression graph. It's kind of a fancy way of saying it arrays sort of they, they chain together and they they sort of turn each other one array becomes another array becomes another array so step one we declare a variable and it's sig and sig is equal to this lf saw and the frequency argument for lf saw is the array 80 81 so we start i'm gonna i'm actually gonna do some like pseudo code here so that's that and by providing an array, this invokes multi-channel expansion, and it causes the enclosing unit generator to transform into the following. It's an array containing two LF saws, and the items in the frequency array are distributed to each item in the array. All right, next thing that happens is... Uh, we uh, send it through a filter. Uh, and so at the end of this line, uh, when this line is, is sort of processed, sig is, and I, I stress the word is, an array of size two. It's not just a singular thing anymore. Well, it is a singular thing, but it's a collection of two things, two sawtooth waves at different frequencies. So that is what's being fed into uh, this low pass filter and the same result uh, takes place here the same the same process so this LPF UGen has an array as one of its arguments and so multi-channel expansion takes place and what we get is uh, this Um, because we fed LPF an array of size 2, the zeroth item got put in an LPF at the beginning of an array, and then the other item in this array got the other LF saw for the input for the LPF. So it's, oh, I forgot something very important. 500, 500, right? Um, there's just one item here. It's just the number. So that number gets assigned to each one of these. And then the last thing that happens is we take this array, again, of size 2, containing this and that, and we multiply it by 0.1. And just to refresh your memory about how multiplication and other basic operations are defined for arrays, if we take this and multiply it by 0.1, that multiplication is applied to each item in the array. Same thing with addition. So this is convenient because it allows us to apply a process to a multi-channel signal very easily. So the last stage, sig equals sig times 0.1, uh, it's transformed into this. Right. So here is how we write it 
and we start with something very simple and this is what is meant when the guide file says multi-channel expansion propagates through the expression graph. Um, this receives an array and expands to an array. Uh, and then this receives that array and expands to an array. And then this operation is applied to an array. And the result also is an array. So at the end of it, we have this stereo signal here and here. Um, so that's what it sounds like. We can like, change it like that. Now, what would happen if we did something like this? Now, think about this for a second. We've got our stereo sawtooth wave with a different frequency in each ear. And then we drop that into this low pass filter, an array of size two. And the cutoff frequency is also an array of size two. Now, the way this would propagate is we'd get this kind of thing. So the right channel has a higher cutoff frequency than the left channel. So as I play this, it should sound like the right channel is quite a bit brighter and more nasal. That's the idea. Uh, let's modify this example a little bit. I want to... Uh, Let's, let's imagine another example here. So we're just going to say sine osc. I forget about this. And uh, let's say the uh, uh, 200 and 500 uh, phase 0 for both of them. And then the array 0 0.5, 0 0.1 for mull. Right. That's a little bit a little bit loud, I guess. All right, so same idea. We have a sine wave with an array of two things for frequency and an array of two things for mull. And so we get a 200 hertz sine wave with an amplitude of 0.4 in the left and 500 with a much lower amplitude in the right. So, uh, sorry, same idea. Okay, now what happens if we do, um, instead of this, Okay, so here is an array of size 8, which has a harmonic series starting on 150. Okay? And we're going to plug that in here. So this is now, doesn't look like it, but Freaks is actually an array. It's just we don't have the square brackets to sort of remind us, but this is definitely an array, and it's got eight things. And if we just say 0.1, there we go. We have eight frequencies. We can't see from these level meters that they're different frequencies, all we can see is that they have the same amplitude. If I provide 0 0.54 and 0 0.05, just take, a, take 10 seconds and, and think about what's going on here. We've got uh, a sine wave generator with an array of eight frequencies and an array of two amplitudes. So it's going to say, okay, the first frequency is 150. That's going to have an amplitude of 0.4. The next frequency is going to be 300. Um, that's going to have an amplitude of 0 0.05. The next frequency is 450. That's going to have an amplitude of, uh, well, there's nothing there. So there's, some, there's a behavior that's defined, and that behavior is for the smaller array to wrap back to the beginning and keep looping and looping and looping as many times as necessary to accommodate the larger array. So we'll see 0 0.4, 0 0.05, 0 0.4, 0 0.05, 0 0.4, 0 0.05, like that. Right? So if we provided yet another value here, then we see patterns of three. So that is that is one of the inherent behaviors of multi-channel expansion. If you have a, a signal of size n, and then it uh, interfaces in some way with a signal or something else of uh, an array of size m, well then whichever one is larger, sort of wins. It gets it get, goes through itself once, and the other one, when it hits the end, it doesn't have enough stuff. It goes back to the beginning and keeps doing that. So uh, that that's how it works basically. Okay, now I want to get back to a central question here, which was where the heck are all of these frequencies? Right. 
we have a beautiful harmonic series here, and I'd like to do random frequencies. Uh, we'll say size 8 from 200 to 1200. Sounds a little different every time because we are only hearing the first two, right? 484, 298. Almost the same thing. So there's another six somewhere, right? Where are they? Well, the short answer is, you know, they're, it's, it's like trying to fit eight cars across a two-lane highway. They're just, there's no room for them. There are two lanes, so you can fit two cars there. That's it. But we have an eight-channel signal and only two channels to work with, so we have to make some sort of creative decision or maybe a practical decision, which is, okay, we have eight channels. The simplest and arguably most boring thing to do is to sum them together. And sum is a method defined for arrays, which returns the sum of the... Um, of the items in the array. So for an array like this, it's really quite straightforward. Here, we have to do a little bit of thinking, but we have a frequency array called Freaks. It's an array of eight floats. We plug it in here, multi-channel expansion takes place, and we get an eight-channel signal. So an array of eight signals. So if we say sig uh, equals sig.sum, it is going, it, we have, um, uh, what we have is, you know, uh, a sine osc a sine osc, and all the way to a sine osc. We have these eight sine oscs. And here is a difficult concept at first, but it's important to remember that unit generators are just numbers. They're just numbers. Uh, they don't look like numbers, but they are signal generators they, and signal processors. They output a signal, and a digital signal is nothing more than a sequence of a bunch of floats, one after the other. Uh, in my case, uh, uh, exactly 48,000 numbers per second. And if you graph these numbers one after the other, you know, they, in this case, uh, if we just look at a single sine osc, those numbers take the shape of a beautiful sinusoidal vibration. And in this case, we have an array of eight of those things, eight waves, and as you know from playing multiple tracks simultaneously in a DAW or having multiple signals on an analog mixer, when you bring all of these up and play them together, their amplitudes all sum, and as a result, we hear them all simultaneously. And that's all that's going on here. We're just taking these eight sine waves and summing them together. And so we'll hear them all simultaneously. Now, the amplitude is going to go up because that's what happens when you add signals together depending on their phase and whether they're deterministic, but you can pretty much always expect the signal amplitude to go up a little bit. So I'm going to dial back on this a tiny bit, and here's what we get. Again, we'll comment this out. We have eight random frequencies on eight different channels, and we say add them all together, and the result is a single signal. It's the result of eight sine waves with different frequencies added together. So the immediate tempting thing to do is to just make a ton of them. And uh, how, however many you can make is kind of dependent on your, I guess, processing power. It starts to, it starts to give you a couple of warnings, but what I love about this is that it's so easy to make tons and tons of signals by just changing a single number, right? There's, you don't have to actually provide the full arrays. You can use these lovely array methods. And all of the multi-channel behaviors are just built into the, the syntax of the platform. Okay, but this is certainly monophonic. So if we're summing, at this point, we might want to say, okay, sig equals sig x plus 2. And this is going to take the monophonic sum of eight sine waves and copy it to the next channel. Turn this up again. So this is not a very interesting stereo image, but at least it's a more balanced thing to listen to, or the sound seems to be a, a centered sum of sine waves. So there's a couple other ways to deal with collapsing um, uh, multi-channel to either mono or stereo. And I'd like to show 
a somewhat exotic example using iteration. And you can actually use iteration right in the middle of a UGen function. Okay, so we have our, our frequency array. We have our signal. And at this point, sig is, again, emphasis on the is, an array of eight sine OSCs. It's a multi-channel signal as far as the server is concerned, which means we can uh, iterate over it and sort of deal with each individual mono signal in iterative fashion. Is it possible to multi-channel expand from the set syntax or play? Uh, no. No, I think the answer to that is no. You, you build your multi-channel expansion into the actual UGen function itself. Um, you can provide arrays as arguments, but it's a little tricky. Um, the arrays have to be a fixed, fixed size. You can't dynamically change the size of array arguments. That's kind of a different conversation, but it's a good question. So we can say, uh, as we know from uh, collect, like if we have the array, one, two, three, four, five, and we collect and say arg n, n dot squared. This returns a new array uh, filled based on the results of the function. Y is now the array, one, two, three, four, five, with this functional process assigned to it. So we're gonna say sig equals sig.collect and declare an argument. And this n is going to represent each individual monophonic sine osc in this array of eight sine oscs. And we're going to say pan2.ar sig. And uh, if we say zero, then uh, uh, this, this causes the monophonic, uh, the, the one channel sine osc to be pan center. And what's returned here is a stereo signal. Uh, we, could, we could just as easily say nn, right? Or n exclamation point two. Um, But we're going to do it this way because it's, it's a little fancy. Sorry. N, zero. And after, we have to remember that we're passing in monophonic signals and returning stereo signals. So sig at the end of this iterative uh, application is going to be an array of size eight containing eight stereophonic signals. Right? We have a pan two, a pan two, a pan two, a pan two, pan two, pan two, pan two, pan two. Eight pan twos in an array is stored in sig. So now we can say sig equals, actually we already have it here, sig equals sig dot sum. And it's going to take all of those stereophonic signals, all eight of them, sum them together, and we're going to get a single uh, stereophonic signal. So kind of a way of looking at that is we have sig, which is an array of uh, sine osc, sine osc, sine osc. I'm just SO for sine osc. I cannot type. Uh, I just, okay, so that's that. And then after we collect, it's this, uh, it looks like this, uh, kind of like, uh, right, all eight of these. And I'm just doing dot, dot, dot to fill in the remaining five here. And then we're going to say dot sum, and then the result is a single one of these which is the sum of all eight of them, right? And so we do not need this exclamation point two anymore because it's already a stereo signal. And just to be a little safe here, let's just scale this down. Pretty sure I've done this right, but let's, let's go for it anyway. Yeah, I did get it right, okay. Right? So same, same thing we just did. Basically, we just uh, summed them all together and then duplicated it. And that's, that's equivalent because the pan position is zero here. But here's where things get kind of lovely. We can say each time we iterate a random number between one, uh, negative 1 1.0 and 1.0. Right? So this is going to give us a float between minus 1 and positive 1, which is going to control the pan position. So each of these eight sine osks is going to get placed somewhere randomly in the stereo field and they all get added together, and this is the result. Let's just make this a little quieter and make more of these. 
I think that's much nicer. Right? It's it's really it's a rich sort of dense stereophonic uh, uh, field. Um, so I I uh, and then the last thing I want to show you is uh, one more option for collapsing large large multiphonic sorry large multi-channel arrays uh, down to a stereo format. So here we have. That we've got our arrays, we've got our 20 channel sine osc, and we are going to say sig equals sig, uh, splay dot ar sig. A splay is really convenient, don't need the sum either. Uh, splay takes as its input uh, an array of signals. So it doesn't matter how big it is, it can be any size. In this case, it happens to be an array of size 20. And Splay will spread these, uh, sort of linearly space them across the stereo field. So the sine osc at index 0 is hard left. The sine osc at index 19 is hard right. And the ones in between are sort of spaced across. And because it's a, uh, an exponential, uh, sorry, because it's a random process picking the frequencies, it really doesn't matter about order. They're, they're already kind of random to begin with, so it's going to sound exactly like what we just did, I believe. I think Splay also does some amplitude compensation. Wait. And we've been working with a pretty narrow band of frequencies, but we could just, we could say, let's go down to 40 and up to 5,000. And make 50 of them. Maybe go up to 10,000. Uh, you know, it sounds like the uh, the bridge of the uh, Star Trek Enterprise. Background noise constantly happening. Okay, uh, I, that is uh, roughly everything I wanted to cover. I totally um, will grant you that multi-channel expansion is new and weird and a little confusing. And it takes some time to get used to because there's a lot of things happening essentially invisibly in your synthesis algorithms to turn signals into arrays of signals and then collapse them back to... But it's, it's, it's one of the most powerful features of Super Collider. It just makes it so easy to work with multi-channel audio. So it's really great for large uh, speaker arrays and quadraphonic, octophonic, anything you can imagine. Geodesic domes. So... Uh, so that's going to be it for today from me. And uh, I, I still got to finish up writing the uh, problem set for this week. It's obviously going to include some stuff about envelopes, gated, non-gated envelopes, and some multi-channel expansion exercises. But I think we're in a pretty good spot as far as this class is considered um, to start moving into building uh, synth defs and making synths instead of relying on function.play. And we'll also get into filters. We've been kind of teasing filters today with the um, LPF, but there's a really rich world of filters in Super Collider. And uh, also we'll get into samples, start loading audio files from our computer into Super Collider and playing them at different playback rates, playing them backwards, playing many of them together. It's going to get pretty exciting. Um, so, you know, uh, enjoy. Hope you enjoyed this lecture. Hope to see you again next week. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And I really appreciate the support. And, uh, yeah, stay tuned. I'll see you all uh, next week. Take it easy.